I can only imagine when that day comes when I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I would do is forever, forever worship. I can only imagine. Hi, my name is Steven Sindoni. Thank you for tuning in to The Road Less Traveled. In this new series of videos, I will share with you my own personal truth. Through the years, I have been asked countless times where do the ideas for the hundreds of movies that I create come from. Others have asked me, where do I find the information? Or another question I might be asked is, oh, what is the secret? The answer to these questions was received by me in my early childhood. I don't think I was much older than six when I first got the answer. I remember watching a favorite TV program at the time and the TV show ended and went right to a commercial. From an early age I was amazed at the amount of people who would sit in front of a TV set in almost a trance-like state. They would listen to commercials that told them what toothpaste to buy, what cigarettes to smoke, or what cereal to eat. It seemed like there was a war going on for your mind. The negative chatter struck a chord within me. The outside world now had become confusing. It was then that I gained an insatiable desire to read books, many books, as many as I could get my hands on. I even created my own creed to live by. The creed was more like a nursery rhyme. If you can eliminate the negative chatter, you will get to the heart of the matter. I found myself reading many books on a great number of topics. I was able to expand my mind and go to places that I could only imagine. Books that I was to read mysteriously fell off shelves. From an early age, I began to question. I created the five W's, who, what, why, where, and when. I can remember purchasing a Webster's Dictionary. I would look up the meanings of words and try to dissect the words to find a hidden secondary meaning within the word itself. And not long after, I came up with some very startling discoveries. To make my point here, I'll use an example. The word consent. So I'd like to take out my dictionary and write down its definition and share that with you. The definition of the word consent is to give approval. In the dictionary, I noticed many words that started with the prefix con. I then decided to look up the word con to get its definition. The definition of con is to commit to memory or to study or examine closely. I then went back and looked at the list of all the words that began with con. I then went back and looked up the definition for the word trick. The definition for the word trick is to deceive by cunning or artifice. It was there that I learned some of the synonyms for that word, which were sucker, take in, or mislead. I was now having serious questions about what was written in the dictionaries. Just because it was printed did not make it so. It was this early renaissance of thinking that freed my mind from the shackles of servitude. It was then at that point that I realized the individuals responsible for creating the English language were trying to use words to con or coerce people into becoming sheeple. Thus, I always made it a point only to give my approval, but never to give my consent to anything, because I felt if I gave my consent, I would be conned and then sent somewhere that I didn't want to be. At an early age, I found myself at the crossroads of life. It was then that I knew I would take the road less traveled. I grew up in an Italian-American household with my grandparents in a two-family house on 220 Hopkins Street. I was raised as a Roman Catholic. My grandparents were of Italian descent. My grandmother was a small woman in stature. She stood less than five feet tall. Grandmother Teresa was born on the Mediterranean coast of Lazio, Italy, in the city of Formia. The ancient city of Formia lies approximately 90 miles from Rome. During the days of the Roman Empire, Formia became a noted seaside resort for the Roman aristocracy. My grandfather, Antonio, or Anthony as he was called, was now in his mid-seventies. My grandfather was born in the province of Messina, Sicily. His family was fortunate to survive the devastating earthquake in 1908. All of my grandparents' children, with the exception of my father, were born in Italy and would later follow my grandfather to America. 
My grandfather was no different than any other immigrant at the time. His dream was to bring his family to America. He sought a better way of life for all of his children. But my grandmother wasn't so easily convinced. It took my grandfather approximately nine years to convince my grandmother, but in between he was going back and forth to Italy and fathering more children. My grandfather was a man of honor. He was a good man, decent and sincere. He was opposed to individuals who would cheat, defraud, or use deception to coerce others. One of the first lessons I learned from my grandfather was that it was important to live with honor and not ruin the family name. And since I was spending a lot of time with my grandfather, I was very inquisitive about his life in Italy. My grandfather would tell me stories about his early life in Messina, Sicily. He spoke of an era before the 1920s, long before Benito Mussolini established a fascist dictatorship in the country. My grandfather spoke of his disapproval of the disastrous alliance with Adolf Hitler of Nazi Germany that led to Italy's embarrassing crushing defeat in World War II. He taught me to use reason and logic before making any decisions, that I should not follow blindly like sheep. My grandfather knew that because of his smoker he did not have much longer to live. I listened closely to what this great thinker had to say. It was from my grandfather that I learned to trust, but verify. I can remember coming home from school on November 22, 1963, when the news was announced that President Kennedy had been shot. Later that evening, I sat down with my grandfather, and we watched the 6 o'clock news. After listening to the report that President Kennedy was now dead, my grandfather began shaking his head and said, Examine the evidence, and there you will discover the motive. And after examining the evidence, you will find out who is guilty of this heinous crime. My grandfather was not a conspiracy theorist. He just questioned the facts surrounding the event. In the days and weeks that followed, my cousins and uncles all spoke of the Kennedy assassination and came to the conclusion they believed that Kennedy was part of an executive execution done by a covert group within our government. This startling revelation was more than any 10-year-old can handle. But I guess I was no ordinary 10-year-old child at that time. As I remember it now, it was the shot that was heard round the world. It was in the following month of December of 1963 that my grandfather had asked me if I would like to go to Italy and accompany him to see the old world. It was then that I realized that my grandfather didn't have much longer to live. His emphysema had gotten progressively worse and he was now coughing blood with every puff of his cigarette that he would inhale. My grandfather died abruptly before we could take this trip to Italy together. My sudden grandfather's passing hit me like a ton of bricks. I was grief-stricken for a period of one year after his passing. Though I knew my grandfather would no longer be suffering and he was in a better place, I began to pray for him. And it was through these prayers that I was able to get through it. As a young lad, I learned valuable lessons from my grandparents. These two wonderful people gave me the ability to love everyone unconditionally. And from my grandfather, I learned the ability to know the difference between right and wrong. And it is when you see an injustice that you use this as an opportunity to change things for the better. To take a stand and voice your opinion to change things for the betterment of humanity. And this pretty much defines who I am, who Stephen Sindoni is as a man. These early beginnings have galvanized my personality. One of the most valuable lessons in life I came away with is to know thyself. It was during these next several years that I became the conscious observer of all of my experiences and those around me. The death of my grandparents and the untimely divorce of my parents forced me to develop a totally different vantage point than any of my friends. The world as I had once known it had now totally changed. And as I share this once painful experience, I can see it now as a benefit and not an adversity in the saga of my life. Here now are the events of my life as I recall them. It was now the mid-1960s. My mother had moved my brother and I to a new neighborhood. Everything had now changed. I would find myself going to the cemetery and visiting my grandparents on a regular basis. I was trying to figure out the reason for losing the two most influential people in my life. Looking back at it now, I was privileged to have been a part of their lives 
and they a part of mine. I spent quite a bit of time in silence, and this is where I began to listen to the voice from within. Some call it their inner voice, some call it their higher selves. There are many descriptions for this phenomenon, and I'll call it the inner voice of reason. It was the late 1960s and the civil rights movement was now in place. A young Dr. Martin Luther King was preaching racial equality. It was a time when there was a racial tension in every city in America. I could never comprehend how anyone could detest another person because of his or her skin color. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a political activist and Southern Baptist minister. He was one of the greatest speakers in United States history. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Had a Dream speech delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. was heartfelt. Despite the tensions, the march was a resounding success. More than a quarter of a million people of diverse ethnicities attended the event, which led to him being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. Then on April 4, 1968, I heard the second shot that was heard round the world. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the black American civil rights leader, was assassinated. He was now dead. He was shot in the neck while standing on a hotel balcony with the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and then he dies at a local Memphis, Tennessee hospital. I can only ask myself, why was another great leader gunned down? Why? I was still too young to understand. And then not long after, Dr. Martin Luther King's good friend, Bobby Kennedy, was assassinated by Sirhan B. Sirhan in the ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California. Questions are still being asked today concerning Sirhan's motive and whether he was part of a conspiracy or mired in controversy to this day. As I recant my story, the 1960s were very controversial and turbulent time in America. But on the flip side, the year 1969 had a great deal of memorable events. Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon. Shortly thereafter, in August, there was Woodstock, a memorable musical event. An event that I had numerous opportunities to buy tickets and I had rides to get there. But for some unknown reason, I chose not to. But while all of my friends were at Woodstock, I met a new girl. Her name was Debbie. So I guess I did know the reason why I didn't go. If I can use a sports analogy here from baseball, some of the best trades are the ones that aren't made. And some of the best decisions you'll ever make in your life are the ones to stand pat and the ones that you don't make. And 1969 had a couple other memorable events. Joe Willie Namath of the New York Jets defeated the Goliath Johnny Unitas of the Baltimore Colts to win the Super Bowl. We even had a horrific weather and hurricane, Camille, to contend with. Then on May 4th, 1970, I heard the fourth shot that was heard round the world. I had just turned 17 in March, so now I was fully able to understand. And then I read the newspaper headlines that read, America kills its children. Students came out of the Kent State campus and scores of others to protest the bombing of Cambodia. Some rocks were thrown, some windows were broken, and an attempt was made to burn the ROTC building. Governor James Rhodes sent in a National Guard. Many students were injured or killed in protest of this unpopular war. The public was now in an uproar. The United States government was forced to go to a military lottery draft. Then in the following year, in March of 1971, I received by mail my United States draft card. And shortly thereafter, I was sent a letter to report for a physical. After completing the physical, I was given a status of 1A, which meant I would be the first one to go to war. But growing up in Brooklyn gave me a lot of experience to see war on the streets. I had first-hand knowledge. There were many nights that I heard gunshots fired. There was a war going on in the streets. It was called poverty. There were no silver spoons in my neighborhood. All of the spoons were tarnished. I watched a lot of my friends get drafted and go off to fight a war in Vietnam. Some returning in pine boxes while others coming home either wounded or drug addicts. I asked a few of those returning what did they learn their experiences in Vietnam. I was told that the war wasn't about communism and fighting the Viet Cong. It was about guarding the poppy fields. It was about the drugs, the opium. It was about drugs. I was now beginning to connect the dots. Is this why John F. Kennedy was killed and why Lyndon Baines Johnson then, after Kennedy's death, sent in thousands of troops into Vietnam? I believe it was in June of 1971 that I was in the first military lottery. I remember going down to the newsstand and picking up a newspaper to find out what numbers had been called. I remember jumping up for joy. I was elated. My number was not chosen. I dodged a bullet. Many of my friends weren't so lucky. Looking back at it now, I don't think luck had anything to do with it. It just wasn't in my paradigm. I did not believe in war. I did not believe that killing another human being would settle any differences or create solutions to diplomatic affairs, nor do I believe it now.
I will be forever indebted to all those valiant souls who lost their lives in Kent State and Ohio on that fatal day, and all those who lost their lives in the senseless war in Vietnam. I think that all politicians should have to send their sons and daughters to battle first. I think it is now their turn to start guarding the poppy fields. The 1970s was a decade highly charged with global tension and domestic uncertainty. The decade began with the news that heroin use among United States troops in South Vietnam had now reached epidemic proportions. In September of 1970, Army medical officers questioned 3,103 soldiers of the American Division and found that 11.9% had used heroin since their arrival in Vietnam which by my calculations translates to 383 soldiers using drugs while on active duty in Vietnam. And I was a witness to this, knowing some of these 383 soldiers who had returned home at this time. It was now 1971. United States planes bombed Viet Cong supply routes in Cambodia, spreading the war beyond Vietnam. In 1971, the Pentagon Papers was published in the New York Times. Lieutenant William Calley was found guilty a premeditated murder in the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. In 1971 was also the year that the 26th Amendment to the Constitution was passed, allowing 18-year-olds to vote. I would now get my chance to express my opinion and vote against the war in Vietnam. Then in 1972, British anthropologist Richard Leakey discovers a 2.5 million year old human skull in Kenya. And it was this discovery that piqued my interest in unknown mysteries. Also in 1972, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover dies after serving 48 years. Many FBI records are destroyed after his death. Even to this present day, there are those who speculate that he was killed because he knew too much. And the name George Herbert Walker Bush circulated around this rumor. But alas, dead men tell no tales. Also in 1972, President Richard Nixon is re-elected in a near landslide victory. And in late 1972, the White House Office for Drug Abuse Prevention interviewed 900 enlisted men who had returned from Vietnam in September of 1971, the peak of the epidemic, and found that 44% had tried opiates while in Vietnam and 20% regarded themselves as having been addicted. These new revelations were, were startling. There were more American heroin users in South Vietnam, 81,300, than there were in the entire United States, 68,000. It became very obvious to me the war was not about communism, it was about drugs. And they were becoming readily available at most every street corner in New York City. In 1973, the Watergate scandal breaks. In this scandal, there were five men, among them ex-FBI man G. Gordon Liddy, an ex-CIA man, E. Howard Hunt, involved in a political burglary on the Democratic Party headquarters with the knowledge of President Richard Nixon. And to make matters worse, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigns after income tax scandal is revealed. Here in 1973, the White House now releases transcripts of the tape recordings. The evidence revealed in this tapes clearly ties Richard Nixon to the Watergate cover-up. But there was now a glimmer of some good news coming from Vietnam. There was a ceasefire declared, but fighting continued. Somebody had to protect the poppy fields, I guess. In 1974, President Nixon resigns as articles of impeachment are filed. Gerald Ford now takes the oath of office on August 9, 1974, and he declares, I assume the presidency under extraordinary circumstances. And one of his first acts in office is to pardon Richard Nixon. And 1974 was also a year of an oil crisis, but profits of the top oil companies in the world increased by an average of 93%. Oil prices had now skyrocketed from $1.50 a barrel to $11.56 a barrel over the course of a few months. And I can remember vividly waiting on long lines to purchase gas for my car. And to make matters worse, I can only purchase gas on days that were either odd or even, depending on my license plate number. The only good news in 1974 was Hank Aaron of the Atlanta Braves hits the 715th home run, beating New York Yankee baseball legend Babe Ruth's home run record. Hammer and Hank, as he was called, finally gave us Americans something to cheer about. 
In 1975, many Richard Nixon appointees are indicted for Watergate-related crimes. 1975 is also the year that unemployment rates in the United States reach 9.2%, the highest in 34 years. But then on April 30th of 1975 at 8.35 a.m., the last Americans, 10 Marines from the embassy, depart Saigon, concluding the United States presence in Vietnam. By 11 a.m., Viet Cong flags fly over the presidential palace. The war is officially over. In 1976, America celebrates its 200th birthday, and Jimmy Carter is elected the 39th President of the United States. Mr. Carter aspired to make government competent and compassionate, responsive to the American people and their expectations. Mr. Carter was a champion of human rights throughout the world and used human rights as the center of his administration foreign policy. But in an era of rising energy costs, mounting inflation, and continuing tensions, it was impossible for his administration to meet these high expectations. America just wasn't ready to embrace world peace. In 1977, President Carter pardons most Vietnam draft dodgers. Many of those who fled to Canada to avoid the draft now return home to America. And also in 1977, Amnesty International wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Also in 1977, it was the year of the New York City blackout that left 9 million people in the dark. New Yorkers woke up to find that their city had been looted, there had been a riot during the darkness. Many of the businesses had been vandalized, merchandise had been stolen. 1978, as I remember, was the year we saw the capture of David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, a man who terrorized New Yorkers. In 1979, the Shah of Iran was forced into exile as fundamentalists took control and held United States Embassy staff hostage. The seizure was front-page news for the entire year of 1979. But with the Shah of Iran now being exiled, who was now going to supervise the poppy fields in Iran? Also in 1979, Vietnam invades Cambodia. By the end of this decade in the United States, there were an estimated 200,000 drug addicts. And George Herbert Walker Bush had gained the nickname Big Poppy. Poppy, that's right, as in Poppy Field. By the end of this decade, the light bulb had finally gone off. It was all about drugs. Nothing more. It was about drugs. The 1980s were also another decade of highly charged global turmoil. But it was in this decade when it became clearly transparent that the United States government was in the opium and drug business. And here is where our story begins. The 1980s were known as the Me Generation. Binge buying and credit cards became a way of life, and shop till you drop was the catchphrase. The 80s sustained the trend of the 60s and 70s, more divorces, more unmarried people living together, more single parent families. The two income families were even more common than in previous decades. More women went to college and earned advanced degrees, married, and had fewer children. The 1980s began with a double-digit inflation. America started the decade nearly a billion dollars in debt at a staggering $914 million. I will refer to the 1980s as the Ronald Reagan years. It was a time we were still fighting communism around the world, or so it was thought by many Americans who bought into the government's propaganda. I, for one, knew it was about drugs. If I can use an analogy here, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. In 1980, the newspaper headlines read, Soviets and Mujahideen guerrillas clash in Afghanistan after Soviet invasion. Also in 1980, terrorists seized the Iran embassy in London. Five people were killed in the rescue raid. And then there is President Jimmy Carter's orders failed military mission to rescue hostages in the United States embassy in Iran. And during all this chaos, 87 million American TV viewers watch Who Shot JR? All the while I'm thinking... The question should be, who shot JFK, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy? And this was the year, 1980, that Ronald Reagan became president and Republicans gained control of the Senate. And George Bush was now vice president of the United States, and this was something to be concerned about. Then on December 8, 1980, there was another shot heard around the world. At approximately 10.50 p.m., John Lennon was shot and killed as he and his wife Yoko attempted to enter the apartment at the Dakota Building on West 72nd Street in Manhattan, across from Central Park West in New York City. Many believed at the time, including myself, that John Lennon's message of giving peace a chance was starting to take center stage in world affairs. 
John's message of imagine all the people living life in peace, nothing to kill or die for, where the world can live as one, was too much for these warmongers to handle. Maybe it was my inquisitive mind, or it could have been my Piscean nature. I was still asking the paradoxical $64,000 question. When will this great thinker appear, and why did they kill the messenger? And that's when the light bulb went off in my head. The messenger would have to have no political affiliation, religious or economical advantage over the masses. The message would have to come from one with a spiritual message. And would this event happen in my lifetime? Would I live long enough to see it? And I asked the final question of myself. Would I have to wait for the extinction of the Republicans, Democrats, and lobbyists? Would I have to wait until there was another ice age? But my thought was interrupted. There was another gunshot heard. In 1981, John Hinckley wounded President Reagan in an assassination attempt. 1981 was also the year that the first United States Space Shuttle Columbia makes its first inaugural flight. And 1981 was also the year that Sandra Day O'Connor became the first United States Supreme Court female judge. 1982 for me was a very significant year. The Vietnam Veterans War Memorial is dedicated in Washington, bearing 58,000 names. Significant for me because many of these soldiers died in vain guarding the poppy fields. I was one of the few Americans who understood the reason why these young men had to die. They were only pawns in the game. And 1982 will be remembered as the year for lethal injections. They were used as a death sentence for the first time. It was my belief that we had now taken a step backward towards our primitive nature. And 1983 was the year for propaganda. Ronald Reagan dubs the USSR as the evil empire. Also in 1983, a bomb planted by Shiites killed 87 at the United States Embassy in Lebanon. And here in 1983 is where the plot reveals itself. Ronald Reagan openly backs Contras against Marxist Sandinistas in Nicaragua. The American government now has an insatiable appetite to control the drugs in South America. Then in 1984, Martin Luther King Jr. Day becomes a national holiday. Yet racism in America is running rampant. The only people that are talking about love thy brother is the preacher. And 1984 is also the year that the AIDS virus is discovered. There are many who believe that AIDS is a man-made biological weapon. Then in 1985, the United States becomes the world's biggest debtors with a deficit of $130 billion. The United States military budget has skyrocketed. And in 1986, Ronald Reagan is cold busted. He admits to secret arms deals with Iran. It is the beginning of the Iran-Contra affair. The Iranian-Iraqi war is about the poppy fields. Then in 1987, President Ronald Reagan announces the United States' first trillion dollar budget. The fleecing of America has now begun. In 1988, the United States ship Vincennes accidentally shoots down an Iranian airliner killing 290 people. Accidentally on purpose. In 1988, George Herbert Walker Bush is elected President of the United States defeating Michael Dukakis. In 1989, United States invades Panama to oust Manuel Noriega. Rumors circulate that Manuel Noriega is part of a CIA drug cooperation between both countries and that he reneged to pay the drug money. Then in 1989, President George Herbert Walker Bush authorizes 300 billion tax dollars to prop up the collapsing savings and loan industry. This Bush authorization brought up a red flag to me instantly. Taxpayer dollars are now being stolen, but where is the money going? The answer to this question is Thailand. George Herbert Walker Bush would enlist his old friend, King Bahumabal of Thailand, to help launder the money. They would continue using the same banks they've been using for many years in their drug dealing trade around the world. The only thing left to do now was to track the money, and you would find out who the guilty parties were. But we found out the why, the reason for the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and in Vietnam. There was no war on communism, nor was there a war on terrorism, nor was there a war on drugs. It was business. It was the opium business. They didn't call George Herbert Walker Bush Big Poppy for nothing. And that concludes our series, The Road Less Traveled. If you'd like to hear more, please go to stephensindoni.webs.com. There's a book that you can purchase at my site, Sindoni Says.
I'd like to thank everyone for watching The Road Less Traveled. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship. I can only imagine